What's up, everybody? This is Mr. O'Brien. This is going to be part two of the stoichiometry lecture series. Um, this section, uh, this video is going to be only for honor students, um, and we're going to be covering section 12.3 in the textbook. So if you haven't uh, viewed the video for stoichiometry part one, you should do so before you kind of understand what we're going to be talking about today. And today's idea is talking about some aspects of limiting reactant and excess reactants, um, kind of some nuances that we'll be building from the first part of uh, the lecture series. So let's get started. Um, recap, remember that uh, you guys did an online simulation that looked at grilled cheese sandwiches, right? And the grilled cheese sandwiches you looked at uh, had different recipes. One that required two bread and one cheese and one that required um, one br uh, two breads and two cheeses to make a sandwich. Um, the nice thing about the uh, this activity is that you had six breads and you had four cheeses. So the amount of reactants didn't change for both of them. But the challenge here was identifying the number of sandwiches that you can make. And you were going, you, you looked that the number of sandwiches actually changed. Um, in one situation, the number of sandwiches was more than the other. And by further e evaluating the, the simulation, you can also look at that the number of leftovers also changed and the type of leftovers changed. So like if you looked at in type one, you had enough cheese to make four sandwiches, but for whatever reason, you only had six breads and six breads give you only three sandwiches. And in type B, you had a lot of bread. Um, you had some bread leftover, um, but you had just enough of cheeses to make two sandwiches, right? So this idea of having just enough is what we're gonna be looking at today called a limiting reactant. And, and in the word itself, in the term, it limits the amount of products that you can create. So how does this look like then in, in uh, the real world? So if you look at a recipe of pancakes, the same kind of idea that we hit up in the stoichiometry part one video. Uh, Angemon pancakes are delicious, as we all know, um, and requires one cup of mix, uh, three quarter cups of milk, an egg, uh, and a tablespoon of oil. And it kind of tells you that you're gonna make roughly about 12 pancakes. Well, what if, and you know, see if you can make this connection. You go in your fridge or pantry and you're like, oh man, I got two cups of milk, check, or mix. I got half a cup of milk, two eggs, and three tablespoons of oil. So you have all the ingredients, but you have the ingredients in different amounts as what the reaction um, asks you to find. So you have them in different amounts. Like, and if you look very closely, you'll find that you have twice as much mix as what the recipe calls for. You have less milk than what the recipe calls for, twice as much any eggs as the recipe calls for, and three times as many oil as the recipe calls for. Now, the question is, can you make pancakes? And you're probably thinking, yeah, yeah I can make pancakes because I have all the ingredients here, as the reaction says. But how many pancakes can you make with the same tasty uh recipe um, that it calls for? Well. Limiting reactants in chemistry kind of looks like this. Um, again, we're going to review this Harbor process again, where um, a mole of nitrogen gas uh, reacts with three moles of hydrogen gases uh, to produce two moles of ammonia. And if we look at a micro scale, we're looking at one molecule of nitrogen gas, three molecules of hydrogen gas, and it creates two molecules of ammonia. Well, what if you had three? molecules of, of nitrogen gas and three molecules of hydrogen gas. How many can you make? Could you make two or could you make six? Now, if you kind of remember stoichiometry, you know that one of these makes two of those. And so if you had three sets of these, you're gonna make six ammonias. But you also see from the chemical reaction that three sets of these make only two sets of those. So if you have three sets of these, you're only going to make two sets of those. So which is the answer? Is it only two or is it six? Well, we can predict the amount of products we can um, find based on identifying the limiting reactant. And the limiting reactant will always lead to the fewest amount of products that you can ever make. So if we look back in this same example, we can only make two. We can't make six. Two is our limit. Two is our product 
that we ha uh, that we can have. And the one that created that two product is hydrogen gas, three molecules of hydrogen gas. This is going to be our limiting reactant. It limits the amount of products being created. For nitrogen, we have a whole bunch of, of nitrogen here, and a whole bunch of nitrogen makes six if we had enough hydrogen. But we can't. The reality is that we're given this amount of reactants, and so this is going to be our answer. Now, if we look at um, identifying the limiting reactant using stoichiometry, <coughs> we can use the same. We can refer to the same example as provided in the video part one, which talks about four moles of iron atoms plus three moles of oxygen molecules producing two moles of iron three oxide. If I if I read the qu the question, the question is telling me. Well, you've got two moles of iron, and you've got six moles of oxygen, and it's asking you to identify the amount of product that you can make. How much can you make? But notice that the amounts are different from what the uh, reaction calls for. You only have two as opposed to four, and you have six as opposed to three. Well, we can use stoichiometry to solve for this, right? If, our, if we use the given in this case, which is two moles of an iron, and use the mole ratio to find out how much iron to how much product the equation calls for, we find out that we create one mole of iron oxide, iron three oxide. But if we use our given for oxygen gas and the mole ratio uh, for the equation, we find out that for oxygen, we produce four moles of iron three oxide. So what's the answer? Again, the answer is always going to lead you to the less amount of product, the least amount of product. And that's going to give you your limiting reactant. The limiting reactant in this case is going to be iron. And why iron? Again, because iron produces the least amount. So if you use stoichiometry that you mastered from video one, then you're going to find the limiting reactant pretty useful. Uh, pretty easily identifiable. Well, is there a faster way to spot the limiting reactant? And there sure is. Right? We can look at the ratios of the amounts that are provided and compare them to those that's required by the balanced chemical reaction. The smaller the ratio identifies the limiting reactant. Let's take a look at the problem that we just did, the same problem of iron to uh, oxygen. If you notice that the amount of iron based on what the equation asks us for, is four. But the amount that we're given is only two. The amount of oxygen that we're, uh, that's shown on the equation is three. But the amount that we're given is six. If we find the ratios of these two um, numbers here, we'll find out that iron gives you a ratio of about 0.5, whereas opposed to oxygen gives you a ratio of two. Really, this is a smaller number, and so ultimately we're left with a fewer amount of iron proportions than we are with oxygen. There's going to be way more here of oxygen gas than there will be of iron. There won't be any iron left over after we use it all up. Okay. We'll see if you can uh, use those two skills in identifying limiting reactant uh, and see if you can solve these questions that's asking you to identify the limiting reactant and the amounts that you can uh, find of your products. If you have any questions, hit me up in the tutorial. So if we have a limiting reactant, then there must be something that we call an excess reactant, something that is left over, right? That's what we call an excess. Again, take a look at the same Harper uh, process that one molecule of nitrogen gas plus three molecules of hydrogen gas create two molecules of ammonia. Again, what if we had three molecules of nitrogen gas and three molecules of hydrogen gas? What are we going to create? Well, we're going to create two molecules of ammonia gas, as in the previous example. But we'll also have two leftover molecules of nitrogen gases. So for every three molecules of nitrogen gas and three molecules of hydrogen gas, we're going to create two molecules of ammonia, and we're going to have this excess, uh, react, uh, excess reactant left over. It's the leftovers. Now, how did you get that? How were we able to find that there's only two reactants left over? 
from nitrogen gas? Well, let's solve this. Let's try to find out. <clears throat> to solve for the excess amount of reactant, we need to know the used amount of excess reactant. This is critical. You need to find out how much of your excess reactant you actually used up. And once you find the amount of excess reactant that you used up, you need to compare that the amount that you used versus the given that was provided you in the question. Let's go back and take a look at this same example again from iron um, plus oxygen creating iron three oxide. If we're given two moles of iron and six moles of oxygen gas to make iron three oxide, how much leftover do we have? So we've already identified in the previous example that our iron is going to be, in this example, is going to be our limiting reactant here, right? And if you don't recall that, if we do stoichiometry for both of them, remember we start off the given for both, right? Here's a given for both, and we use then the mole ratio from the equation. Again, given an iron, we find out how much iron to how much product that we get. Gives us one molar product. Yeah, if we're given six moles of oxygen gas, we compare the amount of oxygen gas to the amount of product, and we find out we have four. As you already know, the limiting reactant always leads to the fewest amount of product. So hence, iron is going to be our limiting reactant. So now that we know our limiting reactant, let's go ahead and try to find the amount of excess reactant that we actually use. So how do we do that? Well, let's do another stoichiometry problem. In this case, let's compare the amount of iron to how much oxygen we need. So if we use, again, the ratio from the equation, from the reaction, right? For every two moles of iron, <clears throat> and we multiply it by the ratio of the, the reaction calls for, four moles of iron to three moles of oxygen gas, we find out that we actually use 1.5 moles of oxygen gas. That's the amount that we used up. Remember, the ratios always comes from that equation. Okay. Now, once we know the amount that we use, well, well let's compare it to the amount that was given to us in the question. If we take a look at the question, the question told us we had 6 moles of oxygen gas. Well, if we use 1.5 moles of oxygen gas, then we should have 4.5 moles left over. Again, we're looking at the difference. We're subtracting here, right? The difference between the given amount and the moles that we actually use. And if we circle this back around, the used amount of the excess reactant was found because we identified the limiting reactant. We compared the limiting reactant to the amount, to the other amount of reactant that we need based on the mole ratio of the chemical reaction. Okay. Now, there's different ways of solving this too. You can also go, you know, you can also find the amount given from the product and go that direction to find how much um, reactant that you use for oxygen if you want to go that way. Well, take a look at this example and see if you can apply those uh, skills I just taught you uh, onto this example about phosphorus and oxygen gas. If you have any questions, hit me up at the tutorial. Thanks.